You are welcome to church this evening. It's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Like I always say, it's, I was glad when they say, come and let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a pleasure to be worshipping the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords tonight. And welcome to December, the last month of the year. We thank God for bringing us to the end of the year. He will keep us through this year. And we'll see next year healthy and worshiping him in Jesus' name. Can we open our Bibles to Proverbs 16 verse 7? Can you sit down please? Have your seat. Your kingdom seat. Hallelujah. Proverbs 16 verse 7 says, "Ah, This Christmas tree now is good, but... (laughs) Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes, thank God, Sister Lola. You gave me the version that I needed. When a man's ways pleases the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Hallelujah. And I would say, when people's ways, when people's lives pleases the Lord, even their enemies are at peace with them. Hallelujah. What motivated me to read this scripture? One day I went to the bathroom. I was trying to take my bath. And I have a habit of meditating. After reading the word, I will meditate. I will keep silent. I will hear from my spirit. And I will hear what God is saying. But in that midst of meditation, I was a bit worried. And I didn't hear God. So I went to the bathroom. And I heard the spirit of the Lord telling me, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he will cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. And I said, Lord, what a powerful message. What a powerful scripture. And I started wondering, what are the ways that can make even my enemies to be at peace with me? Hallelujah. What are the ways that I can please God In such a way that because I have pleased God in that way, my enemies will be at peace with me. And what are so, because if your enemies are at peace with you, there are some hindrances you will not face in your life. And what motivated me is that I was thinking, I have enemies at work. I have enemies in the family. I have part pain issues that I'm dealing with in my family. I'm still dealing with these things because I haven't pleased the Lord. Hallelujah. I am still dealing in this thing with these things in my life because I am not walking in a way that will please God. Hallelujah. Why are these nuances surrounding my life? Why are so many things that I don't want keep happening in my life? It means there is a question mark somewhere. Hallelujah. If you're thinking and you get up in the morning and you're a bit worried because of these things that are happening into your life and God tells you that if the ways of a man pleases him, even the things that you're thinking that your enemies are causing to you, the enemies will be at peace with you. Hallelujah. I started asking, who in the Bible please God? There is a difference between walking in life, obeying God, having God, uh, uh, accompanying the purpose of God in your life. And there is, there, is a, there is a clear difference between doing that and pleasing the Lord. Hallelujah. I started wondering who pleased God. That I can look at his blueprint and say, if I emulate this man's life, it means I will please God. Hallelujah. Let's look at Hebrews 6 verse 12. Hebrews 6 verse 12. 
He says, then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the examples of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. Hallelujah. I started looking at big, who are those that because of their faith and their endurance, they have accomplished God's promise for their lives. Hallelujah. And God took me to the book. God told me about Enoch. Hallelujah. Let's look at Genesis 5, 18 to 24. Genesis 5, 18 to 24. When Jed was 162 years old, he became the father of Enoch. And Jed lived after. After the birth of Enoch, Jed lived another 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. Jed lived 962 years and then he died. Jared, sorry. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship, hallelujah, with God for another 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. King James says, and uh, Enoch lived for 300, can we go to the other, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> previous king, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. Can we go in? Enoch lived for 365 years. King James says, and all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Hallelujah. Enoch is a very particular character in the Bible. Why, why am I saying he's a very particular character in the Bible? Because much has not been written about the life of Enoch. But the, what really made me to think about the life of Enoch is because the Bible says, and Enoch walked with God, and it pleased the Lord. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says, if you please me, even your enemies will be at peace with you. And another scripture says, the life of Enoch, he walked with God and he pleased the Lord. How did Enoch walk with God? That he pleased the Lord to a certain extent that Enoch did not test death. Hallelujah. You and I will test death. We will be buried. But Enoch did not test death. Hallelujah. And the Bible says he was taken away. Some of the things that we can know about the life of Enoch is also written in Jude 1. Can we open Jude 1 verse 14? Jude 1 14. Jude 1 14. Enoch who lived in the seventh generation after Adam. This is another added uh, knowledge about Enoch. He lived in the seventh generation after Adam. It means that after Adam, you count seven generations and you meet the generation of Enoch. And he did something. And Enoch, in that his seventh generation that he lived, he prophesied about these people. He said, we'll come back to that. That information says Enoch lived for seven, Enoch is the seventh generation after Adam. And Genesis 5.22, which we have read, says, and Enoch walked with God and it pleased God and he took him away. Let's look at Hebrews 11.5. Hebrews 11.5. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying he disappeared because god took him for before he was taken up he was known as a man who pleased god hallelujah in this life we will live and will pass away and there will be a history that will be told ab about us maybe on our burial or maybe we'll write books about us some people that have 
lived a faithful life or a life full of accomplishing God's destiny, they may want to write about their life as a testament to the life that they have lived on earth. But the only testament that we heard about Eno is that he pleased God. And that is the kind of testament that I want to be written about my life. I don't want a kind of testament that will say, oh, she was a great preacher. She knew God. She lived faithfully. But what about pleasing the Lord? Hallelujah. What does it mean by pleasing and walking with the Lord? That is, I bring us to the title of my message, Walking and Pleasing the Lord. Hallelujah. Walking and Pleasing the Lord. Can we open to Jude 1, verse 14 to 16? What was Enoch doing in his lifetime? The Bible says, And Enoch prophesied about these people. If you look at Genesis, he was talking about the genealogy of from, Abra, from Adam to Moses. But in, when it came to Enoch, he said, Enoch, please God. And now in the book of Hebrew, Jude, he gave us what was Enoch doing that made him to please God. The Bible says, Enoch prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones. Let's continue. We'll go down to 16. Verse 15. These people are grumblers. To execute judgment on the people of the world. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done. And for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Remember this was Enoch talking to the people. That this is what will happen. People stop it. These are grumblers and complainers. They spend all their time grumbling and they spend all their time complaining. Living only to satisfy their desires. Hallelujah. They brag loudly about themselves and they flatter others to get what they want. Hallelujah. So Enoch was talking to these people and saying be careful. Hallelujah. There is a judgment that is coming. Because these are the blueprints or the traits of the people that God was talking about. Enoch was talking, talking to them. He says they were grumblers. And we know God hates people who are grumblers. You see the examples of children of Israel when they left Egypt. Each time God will strike them is because they went on grumbling. Oh, we need water. Oh, we need that. Oh, we have been eating only manna. We need meat. We used to eat meat and fish and onions in Egypt. Moses, why did you bring us here? You brought us here to die. Hallelujah. I remember in Genesis 22 when they had complained. God told them, okay, Moses, tell them they'll eat meat today. And God brought down the meat from the sea. Hallelujah. They ate and he striped them. Hallelujah. So Ella was busy talking to the people that this is not the kind of life God wants. He was a witness about the gospel of Jesus to the people and a blueprint of, and a life that Jesus wants them to live. Hallelujah. Let's look at Matthew 19, 16 to 21. What does it mean to walk with God? God is not keeping us in the dark of what it means to walk with him. He has given us examples of people that have walked with him. And what is the meaning of really walking with God? Matthew 19, 16 says, someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, if you read the previous scriptures, it's talking about children coming to Christ and they wanted to stop them. And Jesus was like, stop them not for the kingdom of God is made of such Hallelujah. So for you to walk with God and enter into his kingdom, you must be like a child. But another intriguing thing came. And in verse 19, someone came to Jesus with this question, teacher. And Jesus answered, honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. Continue. 
have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied, what else must I do? And Jesus said, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. Hallelujah. Verse 21, verse 23, sorry. But w- then Jesus said to his disciples, I'll tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Let's leave it there. Jesus was telling the people that if you want to walk with him, you should obey the commandments. And someone came to him and said, Master, but I've kept all these things throughout my childhood. It's not strange for me to obey, to love my parents, not to, hallelujah, all the ten commandments that we know. And Jesus looked at him and immediately Jesus saw something. Hallelujah. Jesus saw something like an idol. That money was an idol to that man. Because when Jesus told him, sell your possession and bring them and, and, and come and follow me, the Bible says the man went out sad. Jesus was not telling the person to go and sell it. Jesus looked at the heart of the person. I knew that if this man really loves me, this man is really working with me. But side by side is his treasure and Jesus. And Jesus said, okay, for you to really love, prove that you love me, for you to really prove that you are working with me, keep away these things. Hallelujah. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let's look at Matthew 19 to 29. And when Jesus spoke these things to his disciples that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, the disciples were amazed. They said, ah, then who will enter the kingdom of God? Hallelujah. Who then will enter? Jesus is not saying that riches is not good. That rich people will not enter the kingdom of God. But if you place riches more than Jesus in your life, that is when you will not enter. Hallelujah. He said, uh, 19 says, Matthew 19, 29. And everyone who has given up houses. When Peter asked this question, he said, everyone who has given up houses or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or property for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much in return, and will inherit eternal life. Hallelujah. He was telling the people, if you know you have forsaken all these things, if you know that these things are not standing first in your life before Jesus, they are not standing first in your life before Jesus, then know you will inherit the kingdom of God. But if you know that these things are still a stumbling block to you, that you put them first in your life before Jesus, then there is a question mark. Hallelujah. To walk with God is to love him and to walk in total surrender with him. Hallelujah. You need to walk with total surrender to God. You need to walk with total reference to God. Let's look at Matthew 22, 37, 40. Matthew 22, 37. We'll just read 37 to 40. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Hallelujah. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Hallelujah. You must love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. Hallelujah. Walking with God means you have to love him more than any other thing that comes into your life. Walking with God means you need a deeper relationship with him. Hallelujah. Yesterday, I was coming back when I was, I left the office and I was coming to church. And when I want, when I'm walking, it's a time for me also to reflect and talk with the Holy Spirit. And I said, because if you develop a mindset 
that you have the Holy Spirit in you. There is something that I've seen about people. It's also children of God are going to that trend. They don't know how to manage their stress. They cry on Facebook. They cry on YouTube. They cry on social media. Hallelujah. But you forget to know that you have the Holy Spirit in you. And he is your friend. And you can talk with him and he will talk to you back. Hallelujah. So when I was coming to church yesterday, I was just walking and I had like, oh, I said, wow. Why are some people, black colored people like me, that grew up serving God, grew up being active in church, and now because they are in some key positions and they can touch thousands of dollars a month, they think that coming to church is not a priority. I was looking at the lives of so many people that I've come across here in Jordan and out of Jordan that grew up serving God. Because when I come across them, they'll talk about Jesus, they'll talk about their experience, they'll talk about their lives in church back then, and how they had this fellowship and this groaning serving God. But they just lost it. Why did they lost it? They don't see coming to church as a priority anymore. Because they see people bowing to them as sir, sir. They see their money counting and they can move everywhere in the world with diplomatic passports without a visa. And they think that that is all that counts. So when I was reflecting it, I heard Satan came and told me, you too, do you think you're safe? Why are you going to church? Are you not going to church every day because you want God to bless you more? Are you not going to church every day because you want a husband? <laughs> Hallelujah. I laughed. I was thinking in my heart, but when I heard what Satan told me, I stood and I said it loudly. Hallelujah. I said, I am not coming to church or obeying God because I need a husband. In short, if I was coming to church and obeying God because I need a husband, I could have long left the church. Hallelujah. I could have long dropped the mic or long doing the things of God or long testifying the witness of Jesus because most of the challenges in my life that I faced came from the church. Hallelujah. I am not coming to church because I'm looking for these things. I am coming to church because I love Jesus. The conversation ended there. Hallelujah. Let's look at the life of Cain and Abel. The Bible says they offered sacrifices unto God. And God was pleased with the sacrifice of Abel and was displeased with the sacrifice of Cain. Hallelujah. Why was God pleased with the sacrifice of Abel? Because Abel gave his all. Abel gave his plenty. Abel gave the best. Hallelujah. Abel placed God more than the things that he is having. But Cain said, who is God that I should give the best father of my cow to him? I will go and select the most. In short, the one that has been sick for years. Hallelujah. What does it mean to walk with God? Hallelujah. To please God, you need to forsake all those things that doesn't matter to him. You need to stop and have a retrospective of your life. This path that I'm taking, does it please God? Hallelujah. You need to ask yourself countless times, Father, how can I do in this life that any other thing that I live should not be an idol to me, but everything that I do should be a pleasing sacrifice unto you. Let's look at 1 John 2.15. First John 2.15. It says, do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Hallelujah. You are not supposed to love the things of the world. Hallelujah. 
You know, it's a difficult thing to live in this world and you don't love the things of this world. Hallelujah. It's, it's something challenging. But Jesus is telling you today that if you love the world, you do not love me. If you love the things that are happening in this world, you don't love me. If you love the things that money can buy, you don't, more than me, you don't love me. I also give a, a, a testimony in my life that also shows a testament. One day I stood, and maybe I've said this thing, but I'll keep on saying it because it makes, it cautioned me on how to live a life that is not attached to so many societal and things in this world. Because immediately you start living your life and you're so attached to those things. They start swaying you out from the love of God. One day I stood in a high building and I was admiring good cars. The cars were entering. I was admiring them for a very long time. And I said, this is the one I will drive. This is the one I will drive. This is the one I will roll in. This is the one. And my best car is Range Rover. So each time I see a Range Rover, I will just stand and start looking at the car. Hallelujah. And I heard the Holy Spirit telling me, you see all these things that you have been admiring for more than 20 minutes. I will destroy them in a twinkle of an eye. And I, I thought as if I shaked. I said, somebody has told me something. Hallelujah. Because I used to so much love cars. I told myself, I just started working. I said, hey, this is the first car I will buy. From that day to today, the love of cars disappeared. I just admired them. Each time I think that I'll take money and buy a car, something will come and take it away. Until I remove that car issue as an idol in my life, I will not drive a car. And one day I said, ah, God, I need to start praying old. Because this car thing seems as if I need to start praying. I say, Father, have mercy. Let me get a car. Hallelujah. Some of the things that you so love, God will take them away from you. Why is it that I don't have a car? Is it because I don't have money to buy a car? I have money that God has blessed me with money that I can buy a car. Because God so loves me that he knows that when this one starts driving in the car, ooh, God will say, okay, you pay this. You walk on your leg. Thank God there is Uber services in Jordan. Hallelujah. The Bible says where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. You know, people were telling daddy, oh, we're not coming to church on Saturday because we are working uh, open Friday service. This is Friday service. The same people that are coming on Saturday, they are the ones coming on Friday. So it is not about timing. It is not about the days. It is about where your treasure is. Where your heart is. Some people, their treasures are money. Hallelujah. Where your heart is. You will not complain. You will not say, I am not coming to church because, oh, uh, 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 I am working. I am not coming to church because things are not. At times, I wonder how you go a Christian and you stay Monday to Saturday, Sunday, and you don't put your leg in the house of the Lord. And you all Bible, each time there is a problem, you go back and you pray, say, Father, help me. Hey. Yes, we say he's a merciful God. Hallelujah. But the Bible says, if you please the Lord, look at the life of Enoch. Enoch was standing as a witness unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at the life of Jesus. The Bible says when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit says, this is my servant in whom I am well pleased. So it is not about saying God will have mercy upon you. There are some things that God is waiting for you to do. To be a witness unto him. Hallelujah. Let's look at John 1, 6 to 7. That is walking with God. What does it mean that I also please him? There is something that as a believer, two things you must do. The first, God sent a man, John the Baptist, hallelujah, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. 
verse 8. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. So as a child of God, you're supposed to be a witness to this light. It is only being a witness to this light that you please God. Hallelujah. It is only being a witness to this life that you will please God. Enoch was simply being witness to his generation and telling them that stop. John the Baptist was a witness to his generation and telling them that stop. Hallelujah. So for you to live a life that will please God, you need to witness about Jesus. And we you cannot witness about somebody that you don't love him. When you, when you are a witness of Jesus, you use every resources that is made available to you. You use your time, you use your skills, you use your knowledge, you use your house, you use your money. Everything should be pointed to the kingdom. Every, you know, at times when I want to make investment or I'm planning for the next thing, for, for an investment, I'm telling, how will this investment also benefit the kingdom? Hallelujah. So you don't look at your investment only at the angle of you having the money. But how does this investment, how can I do it now so that it benefits the kingdom? That is how somebody that is called as a witness, that is their mindset. Everything you witness, everything you do, everything you say should be centered around the kingdom. Your family planning should be centered around the kingdom. Your finances should be centered around the kingdom. The growing of your children should be centered around the kingdom. I wonder some parents, they come to church, they leave their husband and their children at home. Hallelujah. Or they take their children and their husband is sleeping in the house. You will not sleep with me on that bed. The next day when I come, I sleep in the guest room, you sleep in the room. Hallelujah. How can you stay and you don't come to church? Especially for the men. You go to church, only the women fool everywhere. They are praying for their husbands. And the husbands, they are there chasing money. It's good though. But the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Let's stand. Hallelujah. If you want to live a life of Enoch, the Bible says Enoch walked with God. He pleased God and he did not taste death. And what was the testament of Enoch? He was talking about Jesus. He was talking about the life of God. Warning the people that this day there will be a judgment. Stay away from it. God is calling us to a superior life. A life that is full of witness. A life that is full of his kingdom. That is centered around the kingdom and the love of God. Just ask yourself, say, Father, help me to live the life of Enoch. Help me to live the life that Enoch lived. Let me be a witness of this kingdom. Let me be a witness of the testament of the love of God. That everything I do should be centered around Christ in the name of Jesus. Say, Father, help me. I want to be an example of your witness in my family, in my nation, in my kingdom. That anything I do should be centered around Christ in the name of Jesus. Have mercy upon me if I have been selfish. Have mercy upon me if I have placed other things above you. If I have placed money above you. If I have placed other things so God above you. Have mercy upon me Jesus. I need oh God to serve you with a right mind, with a right standing knowing that oh Father it is when I witness about you that will please you. Have mercy upon me, Lord. In Jesus' name we have prayed.